Good day and welcome to another session of the Public Intellectual Lecture Series. I am Leo from the Department from the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, and today's session involves economics and the Philippines. How far have we gone under the Duterte regime? We have here for today's guest Sunny Africa, the Executive Director of Ebon Foundation, a nonprofit research and advocacy group. Thank you very much, uh, Sunny, for accommodating us for today's session. Thank you for the invitation, Leo. Mm -hmm. I can share something. Yes. Uh, um, of course, this will be a very interesting discussion because apparently you know, the claims from both the opposition and those who support the government differ, but we're talking about the same reality. You know? So the topic for today is about economics. No? So perhaps you can provide us a brief overview of the economic condition of the Philippines, right? the economic situation. No? Because on one hand, you have the government, or government data even, saying that there's economic growth, a 6.6 .6 increase or 6.6 .6 economic growth since for the past two years. And then you have also the, the supporters of the government claiming that the various tax reform packages have, all, have actually been geared towards uplifting the lives of the poor. And then on the other, you have critics saying that it has not really impacted the lives of those who uh, whose lives need to be uplifted. Perhaps you can talk some, or perhaps give us an overview regarding that discussion. Um, the thing about the economy, of course, there's so many figures you can throw around. Um, but for us, what really matters is we have to look at the figures that matter to people's lives. So I think the fact of economic growth it's true. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a statistical fact that the economy has been growing. It's also a statistical fact the economy has been growing more rapidly mm -hmm. in the last, more or less the last five to ten years compared to previous decades. But also, it's a statistical fact the economy is not creating enough jobs and the number of poor people are increasing. So for us, it's not actually a question of um, who's saying what's factual or not, what's mm -hmm. true or not. It's actually choosing what fact matters for us when we assess the economy. Mm -hmm. So for us, we will grant that the economy has been growing. Mm -hmm. We will grant that it has been growing most at the most rapid rate mm -hmm. in maybe like three to four decades. But I think people who hold on to facts have to accept the fact the economy is creating less jobs now than before. Mm -hmm. The fact is also there are more poor people now than in the country's history. So for us, I think um, let's not be sort of let's not look for single figures mm -hmm. about the economy to say that's the state of the economy. Let's look for the most important figures about the state of the people. And that's what the economy is about. Because in the end, growth does not mean anything if the people aren't feeling it. And right now, I think the sad reality is, despite the growth, the people are not feeling economic growth. Some people are getting very, mm -hmm. very wealthy. Mm -hmm. They're probably the ones who are quite happy to talk about economic growth because it reflects increasing profits, increasing mm -hmm. wealth. But that is not the state of the economy. Or how, but that's the point. Now, how do we reconcile that contradiction? Because on one hand, you said it's an objective reality, a statistical reality, that there is an increase in the there's an increase in growth, there's an increase in you mentioned something about I think um, uh, certain uh, or growth being increased, no? And then on the other, what you're also saying, it's also an objective reality that people do not have jobs, or a lot there's an increasing rate in people not having jobs, no? or not having an adequate quality of life, no? Perhaps we can start this discussion, not because that's a very loaded question, I think. No? But let's start with that, with the with an explanation of why, for example, the economy is booming, or the economy is, or this wealth is being generated, no, or a lot of wealth is being generated. Actually, um, there is no contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, there's only a contradiction if we hold on to the assumption that an economy um, automatically reflects the conditions of the people. Um, I'm saying this whole contradiction because the economy is doing what it's doing by design. And that's actually where the problem lies. Um, in principle, an economy should serve the needs of the greatest number. That's what we all believe. That's what people who talk about economic development like to believe. But if, um, if it seems like there's a contradiction between growth and underdevelopment, that contradiction disappears once we accept the hard, the mm -hmm. brutal fact the economy is not designed for the people. Mm -hmm. The way the economy is structured right now, it's a very elite-driven, elite-dominated economy. Mm -hmm. We have a political system making economic policy decisions for the interests of a few, for the interests of the wealthy, mm -hmm. versus the interests of the many. So the reason I'm saying that's not a contradiction because by design, um, when you're talking about a free market economy mm -hmm. that's unregulated, um, we're talking about economic policies that prioritize profits and the market mm -hmm. over the needs of the many, 
what we will have is what is happening right now, which is not which is not contradictory. It's a natural result of an economy that um, relies on the unregulated free market, and I think that's such an important point to mm-hmm. grasp because it's not just a matter of let's have faster growth mm-hmm. and then we will have more development. If the economy is designed that that growth is not going to go to the many, no matter how fast your growth is, it is by design going to concentrate wealth and profits in a few while not creating enough jobs and um, relieving poverty because that is not the objective of current economic policy right now. Mm -hmm. So that's a long-winded way of saying Mm -hmm. this whole contradiction Um, because the economy is unfortunately designed for a few, not designed for the many. So for us, it's a political question. I don't think we're living in much of a democracy right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't have a political democracy if there's lack of democracy in the economy. And if there's no democracy in the economy, we will have political decision making for the interests of a few, leading to the seeming contradiction, mm-hmm. but actually um, intrinsic outcome of an undemocratic economy. Mm-hmm. But again, no? because you're mentioning the free market, now you're mentioning this lazy sphere point of view that everyone should be able to have an the opportunity to compete and it should be sort of like a functional meritocracy you know where the fittest can actually survive or the most competent can actually survive no? but the point there is shouldn't the government be regulating these things no? because as as the duterte government has proclaimed that, that the train law the tax reform law should actually impact the poor rather than the rich and that's what the government is also saying the train law is actually impacting positively growth and also um, inclu- uh, inclusivity because now most of the government should now be able to accumulate funds to impact the lives of the poor. No? So why is that? Because why, if that's the problem with the system, what is the government doing to regulate that system or at least to fix that system? No? Um, that's a good specific example, the train law. Um, first, it's not true that the train law is helping economic growth and helping development. Mm. If anything, the train law is designed to transfer wealth from the poorest to the richest. Mm. And that is by design. What does the train law do? Train package one um, reduced personal income taxes mm. on the richest families. Um, by our estimation, the top 20% of um, wealthiest families in the mm. Philippines will be paying less personal income tax. Be- because the government needs revenue, the reduction in revenues from lowering personal income tax on the richest mm. is made up for by increasing consumption taxes on everyone, including the poorest 80%. Mm-hmm. So the net effect is the rich 20%, they are paying higher consumption taxes, mm-hmm. but they get more in their pocket from lower personal income taxes that in the end, they have more money in their pocket. Mm-hmm. The problem is with the poorest 80%, they are paying higher consumption taxes, but with no offsetting gains in personal income tax. Mm-hmm. So the net effect for the poorest 80%, they have less money in their pocket. So overall, what is happening is you're transferring wealth from the poorest 80% to the richest 20%. And that is by design. So for us, again, we were talking earlier about um, what facts are in place. Unfortunately, the train law is a good example um, of government economic managers not actually being very truthful. They keep saying that 99% Mm -hmm. of Filipino households will benefit from the train law. That actually is an... um, a brazen untruth because Mm -hmm. we have their own data which they presented in Senate committee hearings which they gave to us um, as part of our formal data requests. Mm -hmm. They knew that the burden of the train law would fall on the poorest. They knew the train law would liberate the richest families but they said something contrary to that. Mm -hmm. So for us that's an untruth. And again, it cuts to the heart of the matter. The train law is just a very specific data point about economic mm-hmm. policy making. This is an economic policy designed mm-hmm. for the wealthy at the expense of the poorest. And that cuts across wage policy, land reform policy, trade and investment policy. Unfortunately, the underlying spirit of our economic policy is to make things better for the mm-hmm. richest, even if it tramples on the interests of the many. So, given that obviously the, by design, the train law is actually taxing the poor more rather than the rich. No? But wouldn't the logic also there, or wouldn't the government logic also there apply that they're trying to fall or follow like a Keynesian model where the government accumulates funds so it can stimulate or they can actually create more jobs? So for example, I think part of the funding that's coming from, uh, or part of the funds that come from the train law will actually be utilized for the build, build, build program. No, so if you follow, if you're following that train of logic, no, 
So even if the poor is actually paying more, aren't they getting more from that particular um, from that particular law? Because the government will now move towards providing more jobs for them. Um, again, unfortunately, that is not what's going to happen. Um, if the train law is meant to be funding infrastructure, um, let's focus on the flagship infrastructure mm. projects. There are 75 flagship infrastructure projects right now um, by the government. About 90% of those are transport projects. Mm -hmm. About two-thirds of those are in the country's richest regions, mm -hmm. um, National Capital Region, Central Luzon, and Southern Tagalog. So at a stroke, that belies the argument that the train loss revenues, which go to infrastructure, will go to the poor. Mm -hmm. Because train law <coughs> will be funding infrastructure projects concentrated in the three wealthiest regions of the country, not trickling down to the remaining mm -hmm. um, 13, 12, 13 regions of the country. So it, it can't be called a pro poor infrastructure spending if it's being spent mainly in the country's richest regions. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in all honesty, the poor don't need more roads. Mm -hmm. Who needs more roads? The companies based in NCR, CL, and ST, who need um, um, more mobility for their goods and services mm -hmm. to go to the port area to send their goods abroad or to bring goods into their export zones mm -hmm. they're the, going to be the main benefit of the train law so I, I know it's always nice to have infrastructure mm -hmm. it's always nice to feel that you know you, you have a um, quicker commute mm -hmm. but our problem there is that infrastructure spending is not commensurate to the benefits mm -hmm. and infrastructure spending will be financed by regressive tax reform package which is the mm -hmm. train law so it's not it's, it's a complete untruth the government says that um, <coughs> the revenues will be spent on proper infrastructure mm -hmm. that is not happening but you mentioned that specifically because farm to market roads are sort of like part of this package of, or part of the infrastructure package offered by the Duterte government. No? You also mentioned Central Luzon and Southern Tagalog. No? Because I was thinking about the recent events regarding farmers. No? Um, apparently, there's a contradiction with, between what the government wants for food supply and the condition of farmers. No? Wouldn't infrastructure or farm-to-market roads from Central Luzon to NCR and Sa Southern Tagalog to NCR, no? and even from other regions in Mindanao to Davao no? as the ports, port areas, no? wouldn't these actually contribute to alleviating or actually improving the lives of farmers? No? Isn't that part of the government framework? Um, actually again, another good example, the rice liberalization law, well, sometimes called the rice tarification law. Um, the rice liberalization law, it took away protections for rice for domestic, the domestic rice industry. Mm -hmm. um, so it took away import quotas, it took away the regulatory authority of the National Food Authority, and it opened up the country to basically unlimited rice imports as long as certain tariffs are paid. So it's basically opening up the country to cheap rice imports. Again, it's by design. Um, the way the free market operates is mm -hmm. it kills the poor. Uh, mm -hmm. it, sorry, it kills the uncompetitive mm -hmm. who tend to be the poorest. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Um, because of the rice liberalization law in Central Luzon, even if you have more farm to market mm -hmm. roads, farmers will still not be able to compete because they have not felt the subsidies to become more efficient, to become more competitive. Yet right now, because of the rice liberalization law, they're having to compete with cheap imported rice from Thailand, from mm -hmm. Vietnam and India, which are heavily subsidized in their home countries. Mm -hmm. And what is happening is exactly what's happening now. The way the market operates mm. is you have cheap palay from cheap rice mm. from abroad. It drives local palay prices down. Rice traders will not get any more from the local rice farmers. Mm. They will buy from abroad, driving palay prices down, driving farmers' incomes down, forcing rice farmers to go bankrupt, forcing rice farmers to find other means of livelihood because it's no longer um, profitable or commensurate mm. to their effort to produce rice. Hence, they will produce less rice mm -hmm. or they will stop farming rice. They might go to construction for short-term mm -hmm. jobs. You have two major long-term effects. Rice, domestic rice production will collapse. Mm -hmm. Rice farmers will be displaced and they're earning like maybe 6,000, 7,000 pesos a month right now. That's nothing. And third, the country's food security over the long term will be compromised and we're forced to rely on imported rice. So on so many levels, the free market operating in the rice industry, again, it's emblematic. Mm -hmm. It hits the poor the worst. It makes the rice traders very wealthy because mm -hmm. they can now 
have markups on their mm-hmm. um, larger markups on the rice they sell. But long-term development and short-term welfare farmers is completely compromised because the, th- the free market is operating. So against that, any claim that, yeah, but they have, free mar- they mm-hmm. have farm-to-market roads, it's not enough. What they need is what Thai rice farmers, Vietnamese rice farmers, Indian rice farmers, and actually Japanese rice farmers are getting. Um, there's a lot of talk about the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement mm-hmm. Fund. It's mm-hmm. supposed to be 10 billion pesos a year. Mm-hmm. That is nothing compared to what Vietnamese farmers are earning. Vietnamese farmers are getting over $1 billion in subsidies every year. Mm-hmm. Thai farmers are getting over $4 billion in rice subsidies every year. Mm-hmm. Japanese rice farmers are getting over $16 billion in rice subsidies every mm-hmm. year. And that's the kind of support rice farmers need. Infrastructure won't help them. Mm-hmm. Rice civilization will devastate them. Mm-hmm. That's a good point, but from I know this is a very harsh point of view. You know, but doesn't that, or isn't that proof that the free that the lazy fair concept works? Because you're now driving, or you're now producing, or you have now access to cheaper rice, which benefits consumers. And now on the other, now if you ha- if farming or agriculture is no longer viable for farmers, they now can move on because that's the promise, deba. Right? You can now move on. You can now migrate to the city. And acquire higher paying jobs. No? I know there's an issue on the long term with when it comes to food security. But again, from the point of view of the individual consumer, and you know, maybe the gov- maybe the government can argue the, the peasant, they can now move on to more um, economically rewarding activities. No? Um, I think it's nice to unpack some some seemingly intuitive notions there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards. Mm-hmm. First intuitive notion, okay. It's not profitable to farm. I'll move to the cities mm. for higher paying jobs. Because that's how lazy fair works. works. Right? That is not happening. Mm. Why? The highest unemployment rates in the country are in the cities. Mm-hmm. Um, the worst um, urban living, condi- living conditions are in our city urban centers. They're congested. They're polluted. They're the social problems of crime and everything. Mm-hmm. So we have to um, disabuse ourselves of the notion a farmer who loses work will have options in the city mm-hmm. because they won't have options in the city. We have a bloated informal sector with very low-paying, insecure informal work. They will not earn more in the cities. They will just bloat the informal sector. They will bloat urban uh, urban unemployment. So that's, I think, a completely dodgy thing to claim mm-hmm. that uh, a displaced farmer has options in the city because mm-hmm. there are not enough options in the city. Um, second point, um, is it okay for inefficient farming to just let it die mm-hmm. and then let the economy because move it's in a certain allegedly way. the capitalist yeah. system is a self-correcting self-regulating system no? again we have to unpack that because there is a prime of place that should be given to food self-sufficiency mm-hmm. and it's an insight that our neighbors ironically where we're getting <laughs> rice from they realized mm-hmm. they realized if we if they let the free market operate in the Thai, Vietnamese, Indian, Japanese rice industry, they know if the free market operates, those industries, those sectors will collapse. Mm-hmm. So they made a political choice to subvert the market for a development end of rice self-sufficiency. Mm-hmm. They're subsidizing their rice farmers because if they were not subsidized, the market would kill them. Mm-hmm. But th- there's a political decision. We want a rice industry, even if the market is inefficient. And on balance, what's more important? what the market says or mm-hmm. what economic development demands. Mm-hmm. The political choice should be what economic development mm-hmm. demands. What people need. It's a wrong political choice to defy the market and say whatever the market says, that's the, uh, that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. The market in the rice industry will say, let it die, import it cheaply from abroad at the expense of short-term transition costs for farmers, mm-hmm. at the expense of long-term food Self um, insufficiency and food insecurity. Mm-hmm. That's a political decision, and it goes along. Um, it cuts across all realms of economic activity. Mm-hmm. If, for instance, again, our neighboring countries, um, Japan, China, um, if they chose to let the market operate in terms of industrial development, mm-hmm. they would not have industries to begin with. They remain backward agricultural countries, but at their periods of development. Their governments intervened in industrial development to subsidize their industries, to protect their industries, not following what the market says, Mm -hmm. hence their industrial powerhouses now. So for us, that's such a key concept to to grasp. Um, We've gotten so used to thinking that what the market says 
is going to be correct and mm-hmm. self-regulating. We've gotten so used to thinking the only activity worth entering into is what's profitable. Mm-hmm. But that is not the point of the economy. If the point of an economy is to create enough jobs, enough incomes for the population, if the point for an economy, especially an agricultural, agricultural country, is to have food security for the population, the market will not give that on its own account. Mm-hmm. The market actually will go in, in contrary directions. Hence, the government should step in to regulate it in a certain way to bring the economy to development. And that's where I think where the Duterte administration and even past um, Philippine governments have failed. Um, mm-hmm. In the last four decades, we've bought into the deification of the market, mm-hmm. we've bought into this celebration of global competitiveness and market efficiency. Mm-hmm. Worst of all, we've bought into the idea that the government should not intervene in national economic development, we mm-hmm. should leave it to the market. And we are where we are right now with growth being very high, mm-hmm. but not enough jobs, mm-hmm. with, gr- with a lot of profits for a few wealthy families and big corporations, but with the majority actually still in poverty. That is what the market has delivered. And by any standard, I don't think that's a good development outcome, what the free market has given us over the last four years, four decades. Mm -hmm. That's actually a very good point. Thank you. Because you were also mentioning about the role of government in ensuring, I guess, competitiveness in a very lazy, in a very free market economy driven system. But isn't the government also intervening in terms of so of government services, social services? Because that's also part of the promise promise of the train law. Now that it's not just about infrastructure, but also providing more for education, health services, and in a way, aren't we seeing it in terms of the free tuition uh, policy for state universities and colleges? Isn't that a byproduct as well of a free market economy where the government actually just taxes people and then? regurgitates, sorry, no, returns no, these, uh, its, uh, its funding into the forms of social service? Again, let's, let's unpack that a bit. Mm. First, um, social services should never be provided in market terms. Mm-hmm. Um, so for us, that's a key, key notion that we have to grasp. Um, health and education, to some degree even housing, if, the bar- if that's left to the market, they will be too expensive and inaccessible for too many people mm-hmm. because they will become more expensive because there's always going to be a profit premium put on that. So I think a core notion about social services, the people need it. We cannot leave it to the market and privatize it because if you commodify health and education, mm-hmm. only those who can afford it will have it. So mm-hmm. that's an important point because that points to how the government has to, over the long term, be the ones providing in a publicly um, funded, subsidized manner, health, education, housing, and all of that. Mm-hmm. So um, those can't be left to the market. So that's key point number one. Point number two, where will the government get the resources to provide mm-hmm. health education, whether it's universal health care or free tuition mm-hmm. and all of that? They should get it fr- exactly from taxation. But should you get it by taxing the poor or taxing the rich? Mm-hmm. And that's where the prob- our problem is with the train law. Mm-hmm. It's blackmailing the poor to say mm-hmm. that you have to pay higher taxes mm-hmm. because we're giving it back to you. Mm-hmm. That's blackmail because behind that statement that if you don't if you if, you, if you don't charge you higher taxes, you won't get your services. Behind that statement is you're telling the rich, don't worry, you'll you'll be paying less taxes. Mm-hmm. And that's where the problem lies. Mm-hmm. The government has to generate revenues for the social services, mm-hmm. but it should be um, the revenues should be earned from those who have the most ability to pay that, mm-hmm. which is the rich. And that is a very problematic notion for us under train law. They are making the rich pay less and making the poor pay more mm-hmm. on the argument that it gives social services. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. The rich should pay more so the poor can have social services. And again, that's a political choice. Mm-hmm. Redistribution of wealth, public responsibility for the poorest. So it doesn't make sense for us, for the richest families and with a train package to right now, for the biggest corporations, it doesn't make sense for us that those with the most ability to pay will actually end up paying less, and those with the least ability to pay, who will feel every peso they lose, will end up paying more. Mm-hmm. So again, that's, I think, a, a key notion. The train law should not be used to blackmail the poor. If anything, the government should make a political choice. Those who have the most should pay the most. Those who have the least should pay the least or not pay if they can't afford it. Mm-hmm. So because now we're, s- we're talking about data now, because you're mentioning the train law 
and its impact on the economy. While the while economic data actually shows wealth is being generated, it's not being equitably distributed. No? So it means those who actually have more are getting more, while those who have less pay more for the services that are that for that do not necessarily um, meet the requirements. No? But if that's the case, no? if you're not looking at statistics like GDP, GNP, and if that's the case, how are we supposed to A, define what is a humane existence? Because obviously that is now being under, I don't know, under interrogation. No? Because what does it really mean to have a livable, humane life? And next, if that is the perspective, what should we really be measuring? What are what should what data, what information should we be re really looking into and evaluate when determining the, if there is economic growth, if there is upliftment in the lives of people? No? I think um, human well-being. There's so many dimensions, mm -hmm. but you know, to be a bit crude about it, so we can sort of be be more manageable. We can talk about the material aspects of um, human welfare. Mm -hmm. um, it's so basic. For human welfare, for a, a family to have any minimum standard of welfare, their breadwinners have to have jobs, mm -hmm. and those jobs have to be secure and giving them enough incomes to provide for the basic needs of daily life. <coughs> That's one aspect: jobs and incomes. Second aspect they should have access to decent social services, education, health, and housing. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of material needs, jobs with enough incomes, and social services. And I think that's where the current um, administration is, is actually falling far short. Mm -hmm. um, first, we always stress all the time, there's something wrong with the job data being presented right now. Mm -hmm. um, first, it's a fact that we're not generating enough jobs. Um, the On average, 81,000 annual job generation the first two years of the, the administration. That's the worst job generation in the post-Marcos era. Mm -hmm. Unemployment is actually much higher than officially reported. The official unemployment um, rate is about 5.5%. Mm -hmm. The official number of unemployed is only about 2.3 million. Mm -hmm. But that's because the government has stopped counting unemployed mm -hmm. Filipinos. Um, they made this stricter definition mm -hmm. You had to have been looking for work in the last six mm -hmm. months and able to do, to um, start working at the drop of a pin to be counted as unemployed. I think you need to be looking for work. Looking to be for work mm. and immediately available for mm. work. That's so tricky because by putting those two new conditions in the current unemployment statistics, 2.3 million Filipinos are mm -hmm. jobless mm. but not counted as unemployed. Mm. So that's a problem for us because... Um, when that definition was um, was changed in 2005, mm -hmm. the government has been using it. It falsely reduces the number of unemployed, mm -hmm. falsely reduces the number of the unemployment rate, and giving the impression that growth is benefiting the people. But mm -hmm. I think that's so important because, you know, it, it's so normal in a especially in a market mm -hmm. economy. You have to have a job and be earning mm -hmm. to actually be um, buying your basic necessities. So on the jobs front, there's a big problem. Um, we're a service economy more than a producing economy. We're deindustrializing. We're not creating enough jobs because of the free market framework we're doing there. In terms of wages, agriculture productivity is actually increasing. Labor productivity mm -hmm. has been increasing for the last two decades, mm -hmm. but wages have not been increasing. Why are wages not mm -hmm. increasing? Because they're being taken as profits by the owners of capital. Mm -hmm. So the economy is growing because productivity is increasing. But the benefits from growth and productivity, they're not going to the workers as higher wages because the real wages have been flat for the last 18 mm -hmm. years. They're going to profits. So that's a problem there. Mm -hmm. Again, inequality and also concentrating wealth on the very, um, already the very, very um, richest. So that's where the problem is right now. We have an economy by design, not creating enough jobs. Mm -hmm. An economy by design, concentrating income on the very richest. In an economy even worse now by design, lowering the tax burden on the richest mm -hmm. and increasing the tax burden on the poor. Mm -hmm. So even the social services we're supposed to be getting, at best, we can call them crumbs. Mm -hmm. Because um, talking about the free tuition, mm -hmm. only half of the population, of the student population at the tertiary level is actually going to ben be benefiting from that. The other half of the tertiary level population will still be in private colleges with very, very high tuition. So mm. the, it, it, it's a good step forward, the free tuition and SUCs, mm. but it's still a partial measure to universal education at the tertiary level. Mm -hmm. Same goes for universal healthcare. Um, 
it might seem like a good idea to put money in people's pockets through PhilHealth so they can mm-hmm. pay for hospital services. But if those are privately provided hospital services with a profit premium, mm-hmm. actually, you're paying more for um, hospital care than you should be because you mm-hmm. added a profit premium because the hospital care is provided by a mm-hmm. by a private firm, mm-hmm. like, which, is, which is profit-seeking. So on the social level, that's a problem because health has become a commodity, unnecessarily expensive, instead of being a public um, for public provided social service provided at cost or better yet subsidized. Mm-hmm. So for us, I think you know we have to unpack some mm-hmm. some deeply held <laughs> things that have been um, that have mm-hmm. been told to us about economic growth, jobs, incomes, and even social services. Mm-hmm.